What is DAV's POWMIA committee and what do you do? Well, we, uh, as the committee, we try to stay on top of current events within the POWMIA issue. And when important things arise that may need action, uh, we would report that to our national leadership. And, uh, and we also, we are, uh, being a veteran service organization, uh, we, are, we work hand in hand with the DPAA. And what that is, is the Defense Department's POWMIA accounting agency. And we have a seat at their table. Uh, they have quarterly teleconferences and family events and updates. And uh, we, we're staying on top of all of that. And uh, again, we, when, ha- when necessary, our committee can write a resolution to be brought before the body. If it's, uh, of course, something important that uh, pertains to the POW MIA issue. Um, our organization has... Uh, has passed resolutions that we are to support the DPAA Mm -hmm. and the secretary of defense in their endeavor to, uh, to complete the fullest possible accounting of our missing. And so uh, this is, we're, we're the responsible party for the, for for the DAV to, uh, to do accomplish those things. Totally understand. Uh, That's great that we have this by the way. Um, And it seems to me that the U S stands alone in its willingness and ability to track down our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are still missing off the battlefield. But how does the defense POW MIA accounting agency or DPAA, how do they do it exactly? Um, Well, the DPAA, uh, they have uh, investigation uh, teams, uh, research teams, uh, we have partners all over the world and we send, uh, sometimes they join us in a joint field activity and, and, and our recoveries. And, uh, and we have more, we still have use eyewitnesses that were in the field perhaps when, uh, if there was a plane crash or a plane went down and eyewitnesses that were there to see it. And we use, we have all the historical data, uh, that is necessary to go to the, the people that know where we can get the correct information. That sounds like a very scientific process, and not only scientific, you're also talking about historical. Uh, With with the science part, there are two laboratories in in the United States that support this mission. Is that correct? That's correct. We have our main lab is in uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, Hickam Air Force Base, and uh, we have another lab at Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. And thanks to the DAV, I was able to tour the the Pearl Harbor lab. Uh, I had a, a... tour guides of Johnny, uh, Johnny Webb and, and de- department, uh, director of the DPAA, Fern Sumter Winbush. And while I was there, I had a great tour. I had, uh, I saw tables after tables of remains in various stages of identification. And, uh, I was also able to meet with a couple, uh, forensic anthropologists, and uh, they answered all my questions that I had at the time, and and uh, very impressive operation what they're doing. Sounds like a, a very interesting moment that not a lot of Americans get the opportunity to do. Um, how successful has the U.S. been this year with trying to track down and identify the remains of our fallen troops? Well, last year, uh, the 2019, they had their greatest year ever. They had. Uh, they were able to identify 217 remains. Uh, now this year, with the COVID-19, uh, unfortunately, uh, th- they've only accomplished 94 remains so far this year. Uh, 62 of those were from World War II, uh, 31 from Korea, the Korean War, and one from the Vietnam War. And uh, Unfortunately, they only have about two and a half months left remaining in this year to get their numbers up. But the way things are looking, it's, uh, there isn't going to be too much more activity. Uh, in, in March of this past year, um, if we go into the uh, how has COVID affected the DPAA's uh, in, uh, operation, in March of this year, when everything hit, they postponed or canceled all joint field operations. They brought all of their teams home. Uh, thankfully, they're all home and, and safe. And no, no DPAA employee has come up with a tested positive for the COVID. 
So whatever they're doing is they're doing it the right way. Uh, we're, but we're but unfortunately, we only have uh, they only have they're only going to have 94 identifications up to this point this year. Mm. Well, I'm certainly glad that they're staying safe, but it must be very disappointing for these families who are still waiting for their loved ones to come home to hear that operations are kind of slowed down uh, in the age of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I understand mm -hmm. the DPAA goes through great lengths to make proper identifications and to make families whole, to give them information about their loved one. But wasn't there recently a misidentification? Yes, uh, they use all kinds of uh, scientific means to, to make a positive identification. And believe me, they are very positive when they make an identification. But unfortunately, there was a, they found out this past year that there was a Korean soldier that was misidentified and sent home to his family. And, uh, and as soon as the DPAA realized that a, a mistaken ID had happened, they immediately contacted the Army Casualty Office. They contacted the family. Um, they started an internal assessment of their processes and how could this happen, you know, and they, they've taken corrective actions and they've even brought in a separate team of experts to look at their study, their procedures and, and see how this could have happened to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, but uh, uh, I'm sure that, like I say, they, they go to extremes. They use all kind of DNA, uh, uh, forensic DNA. They use uh, next generation DNA. Uh, all any different type of science tests that they can do, they they're, they're pretty thorough in their uh, what they're doing. Uh, they had to use next generation because we found out that perhaps, for example, North Korea, when they were getting, they were storing their remains of American soldiers, and uh, they were they were coating them with uh, uh, formaldehyde and other preservatives, and that affected the the actual our ability to get out the DNA. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so uh, this next generation, they've overcome that problem. And uh, that's why they use any type of multiple analysis, uh, scientific analysis, they use it all. So this next generation is a way of kind of counteracting this formaldehyde and other preservatives? Yeah, it overcame all the, what they were doing. Yes. That's great. That's great. So it sounds like we're talking about a lot of forensic work and the DPAA definitely employs forensic anthropologists. And I understand one this year was awarded a very prestigious award. Yes, one, one of our forensic scientists, uh, a Dr. Gregory Berg uh, at the lab in Hawaii, has been recognized as for his uh, outstanding work in uh, using isotopes. And, uh, and he, he received a very prestigious award last year, this past year. That's great. Well, that's great to hear. Well, again, Vincent D'Arcangelo, uh, the chairman of DAV's POW MIA committee, uh, I think you shared some really great information that means quite a lot to a lot of veterans out there. So thanks for being with me today. Uh, can, I say, uh, can, I, can I say one more thing, Matthew? Sure. Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, a lot of, we still have uh, perhaps 80,000 80, missing, missing men and women from our war, our past wars, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Cold War. Uh, we know that half, about half of those were lost over water, and there's very little chance of us ever recovering them. Uh, however, we b do believe about 39,000 of our missing are possible to be recovered and identified. And so uh, the, uh, that, again, that's the, the, a, lot of, a lot of work on the DPA's soldiers. It's their job to recover them, identify them, and bring them home. Uh, I still wore, wear my POW MIA bracelets and uh, I wear DAV PA, uh, POW MIA pins and paraphernalia. Every year the DPAA releases a brand new poster which are available uh, for, uh, for anybody to order and get from the Department of Defense. All of those things are good, they're, they're crucial. We're not only honoring our former POWs and recognizing that what they had to sacrifice and put up with their brutal treatment. And, uh, but it's also sending a message to future soldiers that may join the military that if something should happen to them and they become a prisoner of war, 
we want them to know that they are not going to be forgotten about. Uh, we're going to, this country does everything it can to bring them home. Absolutely. I remember when I served in the army and I was in Iraq, I knew if things would go bad that my government would move heaven and earth to try to bring me home. So you're right. It is a great message we send to not only our current service members and our veterans, but also our would be service members who are thinking about joining today. Uh, Vincent, again, it's a great way to get involved by getting his bracelets and other pins. A great way of bringing the message out there. Thank you so much. And folks, thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Matthew.